Um, these are the percentages of the different um, uh, grape varieties uh, the houses ha have uh, given to me. I've arranged them, uh, them from the most uh, Pinot Noir uh, dominant um, to the least Pinot Noir dominant. So you can already there start to uh, interpret a little bit the, the um, um, little bit the um, different percentages. So there are certain uh, uh, Brut non vintages that have over 50% of, of Pinot Noir, so really bringing a dominant character to the Cuvée. Uh, on its own league is Drap Beer today with 80% uh, of, uh, of Pinot Noir in the Cuvée. Bollinger famously is a really Pinot Noir dominant house, as is Piper Heidsick, uh, Verklico and Lanson, each having at least uh, 50%. Um, on the on the on the Chardonnay uh, front, um, uh, it would be um, Jackson and Laurent Perrier uh, that are, have at least fifty percent of Chardonnay uh, in the blend. Uh, other quite big Chardonnay cuvées would be Tetanger, um, Charles Heidsick, uh, uh, and uh, Louis Roederer and Gosset at the moment. And then you have the interesting, interesting Pinot Meunier component in it. We were discussing its role in the cuvées uh, last week. That if you have a wine that has to come to the markets rather early, you might want to use uh, a fair amount of uh, Pinot Meunier to make it soft and approachable. And I think the the um, uh, Meute Chandon is a good example of a rather high amount of uh, Pinot Meunier in the blend. Uh, also, then. We have the two classic uh, classic blends, uh, a third of each variety. Uh, the, the representatives are Paul Roger and Pommery, who have uh, who have the same amount of um, of um, all of the three varieties. Uh, this obviously is just indicative as the as the real blend varies uh, from year to year. So I've just asked from them uh, for an average blend, or some of them have given an, an, a spread, and I've just counted the averages uh, from that. But uh, this is not uh, not a, a fact. Uh, these figures um, every year, but it sort of shows you shows you where where the the, the house styles lie uh, regards to the grape varieties. Um, then comes the question of uh, oxidative and reductive, and I did ask this question from uh, from the cellar masters as well. And I mainly took the figure they gave me. Sometimes I had to adjust it to be more more in proportion with other people's answers. So I would call this uh, more a subjective than a factual factual uh, classification of the styles. Uh, um, so uh, from zero to to six. So uh, obviously nobody at really reductive or nobody nobody at, at really really um, oxidative style, but somewhere. In between, uh, the most reductive uh, houses, uh, I would say, are Laurent Perrier and Ruinar. Uh, and obviously, it, a little bit actually varies um, um, if you are discussing their Brut non vintage or if you are discussing um, their other cuvées. But this analysis is, is essentially based on the Brut non vintage, just to make, uh, make uh, that, uh, that clear. Uh, I think that Pommery and Tetanger are actually very close to, to Laurent Perrier and, and Ruinard in, um, in, um, in their house styles. Uh, then at the, at the other, um, other end, uh, on the more oxidative side, Bollinger and, and um, Jackson uh, would be uh, the most oxidative, but also Lanson, Gosset, Verklico and Drapier uh, slightly, um, slightly on, the, on the oxidative um, side. And um, I think that um, uh, in between, in between um, lie Charles Heidsick. Uh, I find that it's a little bit more um, uh, oxidative than Piper, even if the winemaking is, is essentially the same. But it's just because the wines uh, in Charles are, are so much older that, that it sort of appears a little bit more oxidative. Or actually, it's, it's in between oxi oxida oxidative and reductive. And then Paul Roger and Mum uh, would be there in the center. And I would, yes, I would put uh, Ayala uh, on, on to the reductive side uh, to that where number number two is so slightly on the on the reductive um, side. But I said these are, are but some you might have different opinions on that. Let's not even start start um, um, uh, asking or discussing this. It'll take the whole session. But uh, but uh, but the cellar masters were pretty much on the same on the same. Um, uh, idea with me, so it should be it should be cl pretty close to to this. 
Um, then um, the role of oak. So most, actually, most houses do not put any uh, oak in their brut non vintages, and these are out of the houses we are discussing today. I must say that we are not, we don't discuss everybody because it's it's just too complicated. I uh, I try to include them at least the most, the largest and the most famous uh, brands, and then maybe some some sort of little bit uh, different styles so that we can we can have examples um, uh, from from each of these um, so out of the ones we're discussing today um, um, it's Jackson and Bollinger that have the highest uh, highest um, role of oak in the blend but even here you can you can see that the the, the it's noticeable but in a minor role uh, so it's by not neither of their house style is, is dominated in any means by by oakiness. Uh, I didn't actually include Krug either. You're probably wondering why not. But as we are talking of of Brut non vintages um, today, I don't consider that Krug makes a Brut non vintage. They just make Prestige Cuvée uh, multi vintage. So I don't think it will be would be um, um, that good to compare it to to the the. The non vintages of a completely different uh, price and aging uh, range. Uh, yes, Paul Roger doesn't have any oak uh, in it. Um, I think the Krug winemakers might debate that with you as far as being oxidative. I I I do say that uh, Krug is on the on slightly on the uh, oxidative side. Um, I didn't say that it was uh, very much on that, but I'd say maybe on the scale at number number four. Little bit on that font, but uh, not uh, not uh, oxidative uh, to a great degree. Um, then um, yes, about the then we have Louis Roder and Rapier. I think they manage the oak so that it is there. They use it to a certain extent, but it's not really sensible. And Verklico even to a smaller degree. They've actually just started to use uh, use oak uh, in 2008 for the Brut Non Vintage, and it's a minor minor role. So it's just a small little. Uh, drop bringing an extra layer of um, of complexity, and out of the houses we're discussing today, two have just announced. Uh, both Lanson and uh, Mum have announced that they are starting to use small amounts of oak uh, in their Brut Non Vintage in the future. But uh, neither of them has them in 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 the base wines they are are um, playing with at the moment. But the, that will change for the future. I think especially um, there are lots and lots of um, you know. Uh, Say grower champagnes that have a, a rather oaky, oaky style, but on the on the houses fronts, it's just mainly used as a, as an, a component to to bring in a little bit of a textural feel and a little bit of a, a extra complexity um, to the wine. How much? Yes, exactly. That's a good question. How much does the uh, role of oak play into the oxidative style? Uh, he it. Um, Yes, um, it's a good question. It's it's uh, it really depends on uh, the type of oak you use, especially the size and the age of it, and for how long you keep your wines in the oak. Uh, last um, in the last session, we discussed um, Krug with a short period in rather uh, new oak, which has a much less oxidative effect than than say Bollinger that has a lot longer time, six seven uh, months in in much older oak. And, and if you have a large old uh, oak vessel, like what Louis Roederer uses, uh, for instance, then the oxidative effect is much, much, much uh, slower. So you can actually play uh, with it a lot. And then if you um, leave the yeast, fine, fine least, least yeast in the, in the um, oak vats, uh, it even protects the wine, uh, wine better from the oxidation. So you don't actually get that much of an oxidative character. Um, if you if you protect it um, well. Okay. Um, uh, this crew Crankuvet does have some definitely some uh, some Meunier uh, varying varying amounts in minor role, but it does certainly have it. I, I guess it's it's written non vintage discussion and everybody talks about Krug. I love this. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, let's go on. So the next slide I think is rather interesting. Um, um, 
this, as we last week discussed, um, it's about the reserve wines age spread. So what the reserve wines uh, are used for, it's, it's again, uh, even out the differences in, in style, quality and yield of, of, of different vintages. Um, if you have older wines in the blend, it, it makes the wine easier to drink at a younger age. And then you can you can use um, the reserve wines uh, to um, to build uh, build complexity and character uh, in, into your cuvee. And I think this this picture well exemplifies that that you can you can use the reserve wines in a very very um, different way. So uh, for instance, um, um, at the at the more the houses that have a more youthful um, house style, fresh uh, fresh and young. Uh, champagne, uh, they tend to use rather young uh, reserve wines. Um, um, so let's say from uh, Meuet, uh, Gosset, Tetanger, Ruinart, the, the reserve wines are largely one to two year old only, maximum three. Uh, and then you don't really, then they are there for the consistency and not really uh, for, the, for, for um, how, bringing a real house style character. Most, uh, as you can see, most of the, the houses start to use um, um, the reserve wines uh, from the first year onwards. So they add, uh, add everything from the first uh, year onwards to the blend and always most of the, the, the reserve wines of, the, of, uh, of one year of age. But then you see here a few houses uh, that actually start from older reserve wines. So they, uh, they age them in the cellars, get more character into these wines. Uh, by aging them further and then you might for instance need a lesser share of them and they still give you the character so here um, Laurent Perrier uses from three to five year old um, old um, reserve wines Piper Heidsick four to six year old Louis Roederer from uh, from four to twelve year old um, Veuve Clicquot uh, from one to well actually Veuve Clicquot's oldest reserve wines are from uh, from 88 so they can actually be very old but uh, but typically 10 years um, as such. And then Charles Heidsick in a league of its uh, own, uh, sort of from five years up until 20 years. So very much actually a prestige cuvee recipe for, for, um, uh, for um, Charles. Um, so obviously, again, I have to remind here that these are not these chains every year, but, but they were just, just gave the, the recipe, recipe, a regular recipe, what, what, will, be the, what will be the house. Um, House um, reserve wines age spread. Uh, here we have then the the uh, the brut non vintage and the uh, percentage of the reserve wines. Uh, so um, so you can see that some of the larger volume brands uh, might use less of the reserve wines. Uh, um, Piper, Lanson, um, Laurent Perrier. I'd say that 30% is actually today uh, quite a usual, uh, usual figure for the reserve wines. But some houses like Piper is a great example that they can use less of them, only 10 to 15%, but they are older, so they still give um, that extra character. And I think Lanson is the same, same thing, only 15%, uh, but the wines are up to 10 years old, so they actually um, impart a lot of, uh, lot of character. Um, here again, the, the cellar masters gave me, some of them gave exact percentages and some of them gave spreads where the, the reserve wine uh, percentage varies. So, so again, you have to interpret this a little bit. Um, they are not, not uh, exact facts, but you get the point. Uh, so I think um, what, what sticks to your, your mind here um, is, is really, really the high amount of reserve wines uh, in, in uh, Veuve Clicquot. I think that's maybe comes as a surprise to many who've tasted the wine that it, ha it has so much uh, reserve wine and old reserve wine. Definitely Charles Heidsick, 40% and, and really old reserve wine. So lots and lots of character from the reserve wines. And then, uh, then uh, Bollinger, I was even surprised by the figure. They gave me 50 to 60% at the moment. Uh, they've lately changed uh, the reserve wine policy a little bit that they've uh, They've um, started to add, uh, add uh, in addition to the to the magnums. They have uh, um, uh, they've also started to add the reserve wines from from the previous three years rather than one year. So that has has sort of uh, kicked up the percentage a little bit at um, at, at Bollinger. 
but you can already know if you're thinking of where your favorite is you can already buy these slides you can you can uh, see where it comes from and what is it that you actually actually uh, like in your your house style champagne yes we will discuss bollinger uh, as, a, as a case example a little bit later on so um uh, so let's get back to that and here is the aging times on the lease. Again, so somebody gave me exact percentages and others gave uh, a spread uh, of figures depending on the commercial situation. So obviously, uh, sometimes you are lower on stock, sometimes higher and, and the economic situation plays a role as well. Uh, but many of the high quality houses these days would keep the wine um, on its lease for, for um, um, 36 months. Uh, some of the... the um, um, a higher volume brands like Meute Chandon, Piper, uh, Mum, Veuve Clicquot uh, are able to are, are are bringing the wine earlier earlier on the market and and make wine making um, op choices and, and and varietal choices uh, and reserve wine choices based on that. So they come to the market a bit quicker. And then we have uh, have at the other end uh, we start to have a longer aging for for the brands like. Uh, um, uh, Tetanger, Paul Roger, Charles Heidsick is actually quite curious because what, what uh, they promise is 36 months, but the actual the cuvee, what they have on the market today is, is uh, 50 to 60 months on lease. So we're really getting a massive uh, worth, worth for our money, a really long aged um, champagne there. Laura Perrier is also a bit uh, up from the for, from the previous figures I had seen from them up to uh, 48 and Gosse, which is an interesting style, non mellow style. So they want to um, the, keep the, the Brut Reserve on the lease um, uh, a little bit longer. I uh, actually just have to make a note about Gosse here uh, uh, because I, I consider uh, Gosse's Brut Non Vintage to be um, the Brut Reserve and not the, the less expensive uh, Brut Excellence. So all the figures you will see about Gosse is, is about uh, the Brut, um, the Grand Reserve. 